Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this session of Forum. Very good to have you here. Uh, it's even, uh, if I may say it to you, even more wonderful that Bishop John is here with us because the poor man, he was coming back from Italy yesterday and had a 10-hour delay in his plane and therefore didn't get home until half past three this morning. <laughs> now, I would have telephoned St. Paul's and said, I'm awfully sorry, I can't get there after all. So you're a great example of dedication and commitment, Bishop, and I'm grateful for you being here. Um, Bishop John's had a wide ministry in the church, and uh, he was at one time Archdeacon of Canterbury, and so was based at Canterbury Cathedral, Assistant Bishop in the Diocese of Durham, and is now Bishop of Oxford. And he's come to talk about his new book, he's written several books, his new book, Living Jesus. And I uh, took this on holiday uh, a fortnight ago to Cornwall, not to Italy, and uh, uh, I allowed myself a week to read it. I didn't rush through it. And I must say, I found it wonderfully helpful encouraging and challenging and you can see if you look at the book I'm one of those awful people who turn corners there are lots of corners turned where I thought yes I must go back to that or I want or even I must quote that sometime in a sermon <laughs> there's only one sermon going around Christendom really but um, so it is and the great thing for me is that when talking to people either at confirmation or at ordination, I'd always say to them, love the church, but love Jesus more. Because the church sometimes will let you down, because we are the church and we do let people down. Uh, and I, so I'd always give them that quote from Hebrews, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And as I read your book, I thought, thank goodness, We've got a bishop who's actually saying that in print. So thank you for being here, and do please talk to us now, Bishop. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, uh, that welcome. And uh, yes, it is good to be here. We, I had no idea how many people might be here uh, at this occasion. Just no idea what sort of event it was. So I'm always glad to see that there are some folk. Thank you for coming. Um, it's a strange time to me, kind of lunchtime on a Sunday, to have an event, but, uh, but here you are. You know, there was a bishop once who went to uh, a service and found there really weren't very many people there. And he was a bit distressed about this, and he said to the vicar afterwards, he said, um, didn't you advertise that I was coming? And the vicar said, no, but the word still seems to have got out. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, here you are, and here I am as... Uh, as Bishop Michael says, fortunately, because uh, half past three this morning, arriving in at Oxford, it was a bit grim, up at eight, but lovely to be here, uh, talking about um, the focus of my faith, the one who has intrigued and uh, fascinated me uh, all my life. I have actually been ordained now for 40 years. I was ordained at 12, you understand, but it was... Um, <laughs> But uh, it's a long time. And actually, Wendy and I have been married for 40 years as well. Uh, all happened in the same great year. But, um, but Jesus has been that, that focus, that fascination um, all the time. And, and what I wanted to do in this book was write about Jesus, but actually also about the effect that Jesus has had. Uh, you know, you can tell how significant, uh, how big a ship is by the size of the wake that it leaves behind it. Uh, and you can tell how significant Jesus is by the size of the, 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 the wake that he's left, the effect that he's had on history, on culture, on politics, on social action, on individual lives, etc. And that's really what I, I wanted to, to write about. But we, we live in such a spiritually confused culture, don't we? And so it's in the middle of that that I want just to point back to Jesus, because there is, there is a figure who, a man for all seasons, who I wanted to say, but that's the one we in this country can look to with, uh, with real conviction and confidence. But um, I, I take uh, delight in collecting quotes, um, as it's absolutely right to do that, Michael, use anything you like uh, in the book, anytime. But um, here's Liam Gallagher, 
If I was to say, Liam Gallagher, would you know Oasis? Good, we're there. Fine. So uh, he was uh, one of the founders of uh, the, the rock group Oasis. And he said this, I don't pray and I don't go to church, but I'm intrigued by it. I dig it. I'm into the idea that there could be a God and aliens and incarnation and some geezer years ago turning water into wine. I don't believe when you die, you die. All the beautiful people who've got, been and gone, Lennon, Hendrix, they're somewhere else, man. Whether it's here or whether it's there, they're doing some musical thingamajig. They've got to be somewhere, haven't they? Now, where you start kind of deconstructing that uh, set of beliefs, I don't know, really. But it's, it's part of that complex spiritual smorgasbord that we, we experience today. And people do take you know, a bit of Buddhism and a bit of Feng Shui and a bit of Wicca and a bit of this and that to make up personal belief structures. And I find myself wanting to say, but have you actually looked at this man, Jesus? Because he might make sense of a lot of that. There is a kind of profound complexity in our spiritual landscape at the moment. And I, I think find myself wanting to say, in answer to spiritual to, to profound complexity, there can be profound simplicity. And I want, in my thinking about Jesus, to be profound. In other words, I don't just want to be talking about Jesus wanting me for a sunbeam. Uh, on the other hand, I also want there to be a real simplicity because for millions and millions of us, putting Jesus in the center of our picture has actually made a lot of sense of the rest of life. So there's a profound simplicity, I think, about uh, the person of Jesus. And he intrigues. As Bishop Michael was saying, so often we can get frustrated with the church, but still are fascinated by this man, Jesus. And there was, um, was it a, a television series, I think it was called Primeval or something like that, and, and those who were behind that series did a, a, a survey about who would British people most like to meet who have now died. And uh, Princess Diana was, was the second, and... Uh, um, William Shakespeare was the third, but the first, Jesus Christ, still in this, our culture. But it, because he's always bigger than, always elusive, always beyond our controlling, our owning, there is an ultimate um, kind of elu yeah, elusiveness, that's the right word, I think. Uh, about Jesus. Do you remember those famous words of Albert Schweitzer? They're well-known words, but let me quote them again. He comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old, by the lakeside. He came to those men who knew him not. He speaks to us in the same words, follow me, and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands. And to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. But it is in our own experience. We're not going to tie him down, uh, put him in a box, put him on the wall. You know, we're never going to capture Jesus. But here was this man, it's been said again often before, but no PR machine, uh, no shadowy advisors, uh, no email, no internet, no social networking, no syndicated articles, no books, three years ministry, that's all. How long have I been at it? 40 years? <laughs> what impact has that had? <laughs> anyway, here was this man without any of that, and yet he has changed this world more than any single life. Extraordinary effect, the size of this wake uh, behind the ship. What I'd like to do, therefore, is just uh, speak a bit, well, a personal autobiography in one sense, and then to look at the cause of this wake, um, and then uh, to look at the wake itself, the effect uh, of Jesus um, itself. So let me start first with um, just a bit of autobiography and see whether you might lock in to any of this 
uh, at any point. You, no, nobody will lock into all of this at all, but there may be one or two points where you say, yeah, I recognize what, what, uh, what he's trying to say. I want to just offer a, a number of images of Jesus, because I think we, as a culture, we have, we've kind of lost Jesus behind a, 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 a glass um, that's, that's high. We've just been in, in Italy and seen many of these wall paintings and so on, and, and the wall paintings are kind of fading behind the glass. And I think that's what it's often like with Jesus, the, the bright, vivacious, colourful uh, person of Jesus has got has, has faded with the sun and the and age and so on, and we put some glass over him, uh, and have lost the freshness of this figure. So we have all kinds of images, all kinds of pictures, all kinds of understandings of Jesus. Let me t- just tell you some of mine. I started off with this picture of gentle Jesus. Maybe you recognise him. He's been in Sunday schools and junior schools and so on for. Uh, for donkey's years. And, and, and in my case, he was in a picture on the wall in my bedroom and he was clean-shaven and flaxen-haired and blue eyes and strong jaw and um, had a particular predilection for little furry animals and, and uh, birds that would bounce around on his shoulders and so on. And it, he seemed to like long white nighties, you know. He was, um, and he was kind of summed up in that, that hymn you know, um, what's in Royal David City, isn't it? Um, the, uh, oh, comes, gentle Jesus, no, not, let me, I've written it down here somewhere, what does it say? Ch- Christian children, all must be, this is it, mild, obedient, good as he. You know. mm, yeah, here was I as a young lad wanting to, you know, climb Everest, be captain of England cricket team, uh, all that, you know, and it wasn't a great manifesto, actually. Um, Christian children almost be mild, obedient, good. You know, I thought if I go to parties, if I got to drink fruit juice and, you know, when I think about girls, have a cold shower, you know, it, was, it didn't, didn't kind of work, this gentle Jesus picture. So he began to fade away. But I found in my teenage years, now here's another picture that came up, and this was the Judge Jesus. Perhaps that's a bit strong, you know. Um, policeman Jesus. I mean, but someone who was out to watch me, as it were, out to see that I kept on the right side of the law, uh, that I did the right things. They would be looking at me through narrowed eyes, as it were. I mean, we were never really f- properly introduced. I just found he was there, you know, this figure. And somehow this f- person of Jesus was one who would be disapproving of things that I might do wrong. And that's not a very attractive picture either. Gerard Hughes, do you remember his uh, wonderful book, um, God of Surprises? And he has a story there about, I think there's a man called George, a young man, a young married guy. He and his wife spent most of their time at Christian conferences, it seemed. And uh, on one occasion, Gerard Hughes was leading uh, the conference and he said, Uh, to them all. He said, I want you to picture Jesus at uh, the wedding at Cana of Galilee. So they went and did their exercise on that. And he asked this young guy, George, he said later, so who did you see, George? Uh, What was Jesus like? Oh, well, Jesus was sitting on a a hard chair at the side, stiff, straight-back chair, and he was, had a crown of thorns on his head, and he was holding a staff, and he was looking disapproving. Now, if you'd said to George, what kind of person is Jesus in our Christian faith? He'd have said, oh, compassionate and loving and generous and merciful and so on. But actually, this figure, this much more dour figure, uh, was sneaking around in the background. And I think that is the case for many people. There's a kind of disapproving Jesus around. And Judge Jesus can become a tyrannical figure in people's lives. I had another uh, Jesus around, and this was um, National Trust Jesus, I call him. <laughs> and really, he's quite benign um, and, and really rather well brought up and lives in nice places, um, and we go to see him quite often. Um, we like to keep in touch with places of beauty and, uh, and the old services and so on. And uh, this Jesus is, fits in so well to National Trust properties. You, 
you don't actually need a, <clears throat> a membership card to meet him, but it does help to have an introduction, you know? <laughs> so, someone called the Church of England, didn't they? The, the church that's dying of good taste. You know? <laughs> and uh, uh, the bland leading the bland. Um, anyway. But this Jesus I encountered in the National Trust picture of Jesus was a kind of Lilliput Lane Jesus, you know what I mean? All very innocuous. But a strange thing happened to me when I, I went to university. Um, I had wonderful Christian parents and thanks to them, and I have to say thanks to a girlfriend called Sandra, who started lending me books with strange titles like the Cross and the Switchblade. Anyone heard of that? Yeah. God Smuggler, you know, books like this. I, and I was, um, I, I used to write little um, reviews of them, these, of all the books I read. I was that kind of kid. Um, and I, I remember writing about uh, these books, things like, um, very interesting, but not very Anglican, you know. <laughs> um, but here was a Jesus I was being introduced to who was immediate, who was active, who was knowable, who did stuff in the real world. Um, and this was fascinating. And when I went to Oxford, I went to read law, um, and, uh, and I met a fascinating group of people, and they just talked about Jesus in a quite different way, as if, as if there was a, a reality, a current reality to this Jesus, a living Jesus. And I realised that actually I had all these bits of the Christian jigsaw lying around. And I had lots of them, you know, good Christian upbringing. They were all lying around, but somehow I hadn't done anything with them. And I hadn't got the big central piece, which was Jesus Christ. And when I put this Jesus in the middle, the rest all began to make sense. And it was a kind of Copernican revolution, you know. It was a, instead of me being at the centre, my desires, what I was going to do with my life, you know, my interests first and last. It was okay if you put Christ in the middle uh, and, and I travel around him rather than me in the middle and him being just one of many things that spiraled around me, it's quite different. Hence, I took this uh, strange turning uh, to being ordained rather than being a wealthy lawyer. Any wealthy lawyers here? Sorry, just my... <laughs> my fantasy that all lawyers are wealthy. Anyway, um, so here was this different understanding of Jesus and this living Jesus took over, as it were, from gentle Jesus and national trust Jesus and judge Jesus and so on. But there were others I bumped into. At Terminator Jesus, I came across him. Uh, when, when you've had a, an encounter with Christ, I suppose, you begin to think, hmm, this is good and powerful stuff. Um, and it can go wrong. You know, my God's better than your God. I had, I had a wonderful grandmother who um, was a devout atheist. Uh, and, uh, and I came back from Oxford, you know, full of my arguments and so on, and took her on. And she was one of the most intelligent but uneducated um, people I've met. She just missed the formal education because of that time. But, but she was fiercely intelligent. And we had a ding-dong of a battle. And at the end, she said... Well, okay, you've won the argument, but you'll never make me believe. And I thought, hmm, I've not done very well there. That's not been a very successful encounter. But it was my Terminator Jesus, you know. I can put my tanks on your lawn. Uh, I'll be back. <laughs> that Terminator. And, of course, you do see it again with... Um, you know, the religious right, which takes up uh, particular causes, invasion of other people's... Uh, countries, for instance, um, and, and which can somehow confuse the tanks, you know, with the chariots of fire, um, and it all becomes very unpleasant uh, in a way. And if you, if you put Terminator Jesus alongside the picture of a man on a cross, you know, weeping as he dies, one of those two pictures have got to go. And uh, for me, I stuck with the Bible. I met Professor Jesus, went to Theological College, did loads of theology, Oxford, Cambridge, Durham, degrees, you know, in theology, all fascinating, really fascinating stuff, absolutely. Um, fired my theological in inquisitiveness, which lasts uh, still, you know, years and years and years on. But Professor Jesus himself has his limitations, you know, sometimes you just want to let him out to play. 
just want to say, have a good time as well, you know. And, uh, and I could, there was a danger of getting just tied up in the head, try to put head and heart and hands together uh, since then. And I came across um, Jesus, the Honourable Member for Galilee South. <laughs> Have you met him? I, I mean, he's very important, really important. But, okay, I went to do a curacy in, in Birmingham, right in the centre of Birmingham, St Martin's in the Bullring, fascinating time and place. And I began to encounter the, you know, the flotsam and jetsam of a city that would just end up in the city centre. Um, Saturday night after the, after the shopper's service, everyone else has gone, just those who are desperate or on drugs or lost. And um, the night shelter closed when we were there for a period, funding ran out. Men were dying on the streets. Two or three men died there. The IRA bombs happened in our patch, you know, just uh, a few hundred yards away from, uh, from where we were. Um, and I remember a service uh, about poverty, world poverty, in which I stood in the pulpit and we had a, um, a roll of paper that was, uh, it was a huge, a big church, and it held a thousand, and we rolled this piece of paper out and I said, think of a mark every inch along that, this piece of paper that we're rolling out. How far do you think this paper uh, that's now just got to the back of the church, but where would it have to get to for each one of those marks on there uh, to represent someone who's severely hungry in our world today? How far would that go? Would it go to Coventry, London? The answer was to Australia. You know, with every single inch of the way marking someone who's seriously hungry. Now, it's encounters like that, you know, IRA, people dying on the streets, etc., which kind of pushed me on to see that this, this message of the king, kingdom of God uh, is not just about personal and, and spiritual renewal, but it's of prime social and political significance as well. The kingdom uh, is a, an extraordinary concept to explore, and I was introduced to that, I think. Um, I, I didn't became, become a a you know, fully paid up member of, of the, the party of the Honourable Member for Galilee South, uh, because I don't think he can be you know, tied down like that. But his political commitment and social commitment was crucial. So do you see what I mean? Do, do any of those pictures of Jesus ring any bells somewhere? You know, there's a whole lot from Gentle Jesus and the uh, National Trust and the Judge Jesus, the Living Jesus, Terminator Jesus, um, the Honourable Member for Galilee South and the, uh, and the Professor Jesus, all sorts. I, I just want to give one quote, um, which I came across from uh, Lord Hailsham. And I love it because I think actually this gets as close to the Jesus I try to follow um, as I can. And uh, Lord Hailsham said this. He said, I looked at the Gospel again and quite suddenly a new portrait seemed to stare at me out of the pages. I'd never previously thought of a laughing, joking Jesus, physically strong and active, fond of good company and a glass of wine, telling funny stories, using, as every good teacher does, paradox and exaggeration, applying nicknames to his friends and holding his companions spellbound with his talk. As I reflected on this, I came to the conclusion that we should have been absolutely entranced by his company. And that was the Jesus I first caught sight of when I was 19, 20, I guess, at university, the living Jesus, uh, with whom I would have been absolutely entranced. That's the man who's changed the world. So, all sorts of images of Jesus that we carry with us. And I've been given all those images. You'll have been given images of Jesus from all sorts of parts of your background. Um, but I think actually, you know, just as much as I have found those images, Jesus has also found me in different ways. You know, he has found me um, so often. He's been the master of surprise. I, I, you know, I think I've understood him, but no, he's been this and that. And I think I've got this understanding, but no, he's slipped through and he's going to teach me something deeper. Uh, and I think, I've, I've, I think he's a, basically a Westerner. And then I find, no, of course he isn't. He's a Middle Eastern Jew. Um, and I think, hang on, but he's also a black 
Jesus, isn't he? And then I see a picture of a Southeast Asian Jesus. And I, yep, got to get a bigger idea of Jesus still. And, and this picture of Jesus has always been surprising me, always being bigger. And all based on three years of a ministry, extraordinary. But he's also been, of course, the master of disguise. And, um, and where do I find him now? All around. We find Jesus in each other, don't we? And Jesus is a master of disguise. He tells us, you know, Matthew 25, that in as much as you do it to one of the least of these, my brethren, my brothers and sisters, you're doing it to me. I'm there. And so do we really recognize Christ in each other? How do we value each other? But overall, Jesus is the master, and the one I try to follow and make a mess of. Of course, the detail, well, you know, the devil is in the detail, isn't it? You know, it's the, it's the, the small print that contains the problems. Bonhoeffer says, you know, when Jesus bids a man follow him, he bids him come and die. Not a great invitation, you wouldn't think. <laughs> but you die to self, that a new life may be born in you as well. And, and an image I sometimes use is how, in terms of how am I gonna follow this Jesus, uh, is, is the difference, I should have brought them along, shouldn't I really? Um, it, it, well, think of an orange. If you take an orange apart, imagine me doing this now, um, and taking off the outside, and there we've got all the, the different segments inside. And, and I'm prepared to give one segment uh, to Jesus. It's really nice. That's my Sunday morning one. And so I, I have that. And I'm, actually, I'll probably take another one. I'm on the PCC. Uh, or I do something in church, you know, so I'm, I've got this bit that I give to Jesus as well. And, and there's another bit, a bit of Christian service I do somewhere. Um, I, you know, run a boys club or something like that. Um, but the rest of this, all the other segments of the orange, they're really nothing to do with Jesus, are they? The alternative is, Take an apple, not an orange, and imagine just taking a bite out of the apple. The apple is, is complete, it's coherent, it's, it is one. One bite is, represents the whole. All of our life is a given to Jesus, and not just the bits, the bits of the orange, the segments, it's the whole of our life that he wants. That's the lifelong task, isn't it, of trying to follow uh, the living Jesus, uh, to see Christian faith as, as cons very simplistic, but as consuming an apple, not uh, an orange. But this figure is, hmm, let, let's just look secondly. I'm not going to talk the whole time, of course, but um, if that's a bit of the autobiography of my own journey with, with Christ, let me just focus for a, a little bit on what causes the wake. This, you know, what this living Jesus did. Um, I'd like to think of him as the magnificent outsider. The one who, uh, who came in from uh, the cold and just he keeps on asking awkward questions. Um, what was he? I mean, some people thought of him as a teacher. Yes, he was certainly a teacher. But actually, he had no formal rabbinic training that we know of. So, okay, was he a prophet? Yes, he was, but he was more than a prophet. They said so at the time. Uh, so was he um, a political activist? No. But actually, there are far-reaching political implications for what he did, from what he did. So was he a revolutionary? Well, no. But actually, his teaching was some of the most radical uh, that we've ever encountered. So, okay, was he uh, then a military leader? No. But actually, many people wanted him to become so. Well, was he a messiah? Well, yes, he was. But actually, not the kind of messiah people expected. You know, he's always this magnificent outsider. He's always just escaping. We can't tie him down and put him uh, in a particular uh, pocket. But as a subversive, um, I think Jesus is just fascinating. Uh, I had, I remember, an early part of my uh, uh, time in the ministry, I had a, a DVD, no, it was probably a video, uh, it was called The Stranger. 
and it was uh, about, it, it used the image of, of Jesus as a, a stranger coming into a wild western town. And he came in and he refused to wear a badge. Everybody else had a badge. They were a B-32 or a, 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 you know, an F-12 or something like that, you know. And it gave them a position in life in the town. And Jesus, the, sorry, the stranger, refused to wear a badge. And it was infuriating. The sheriff got really cross about this because how could you maintain social order uh, if people refused to wear badges? Um, and yet he did refuse. And he encouraged others. He said, why do you need your badge? And he encouraged them to take them off. And some of them did. And they had a wild time. It was great. So the sheriff realized he needed to do something. So he did. Strung the stranger up outside the courthouse and, uh, and killed him. Of course, there was a sequel. <laughs> but it was a, it's a lovely image of this subversive Jesus who just refused to wear a badge, who refused to, to fit in. Because in that time, um, in that, the combination of, of Roman rule and the, and the Jewish authorities, Jewish culture, this combination was very powerful. And the Roman Empire, I suppose, promised peace, security, and a paycheck at the end of the month, unless you were a slave in which case you had no rights at all. Uh, or unless you were a small farmer, in which case you were so heavily taxed that you ended up having to sell your land to a big landowner and then you were in thrall, in real trouble. Oh, and unless you were a woman. Uh, that was a problem as well because that meant that you really didn't count for very much. You were supposed to marry by the age of 14, produce a clutch of children, and in any case, remember that first prayer in the synagogue when the men said, Blessed art thou, O Lord, who has not made me a woman. So this was fine. It's all was well in society, as long as you weren't a slave, a small landowner, or a woman. Oh, or a Samaritan or a Gentile. Uh, because remember, that faith is only for the Jewish people. Um, they've been taken through on that, uh, um, you know, assault course through the, the wilderness for 40 years on this one uh, and then that shock and awe invasion of Canaan um, and, and they, were, they were the people, they were the promises. I'm sorry if you were a Samaritan or a Gentile that didn't count, so sorry about that. Um, so all was well uh, you know if you were unless you were um, a slave or a woman or a small landowner or a Samaritan or a Gentile or a tax collector which meant, of course, that you were in the pocket of the Romans anyway, so you were taking a, a rake off, uh, so you were a hate figure. Wasn't too good if you were a prostitute either. If you were a prostitute, you were so tainted, and you so tainted the culture, that they wouldn't even take your tithes. Uh, you really didn't count at all. Um, was actually a problem if you were unclean, and you were unclean if you were a leper, or if you were a a woman, normal menstruation, or after childbirth. Um, and I'm afraid if you were um, mentally ill or had a disability, that counted you out as well. Sorry about that. And of course, there were 10% of people who never appeared on the radar at all. Those were the, you know, the, the outlaws and the, um, and the day laborers and the robbers and so on. So you can see the problem. All is well in this ordered, Jewish imperial structure, unless you were a slave, a small farmer, a woman, a Samaritan, a Gentile, a tax collector, a prostitute, unclean, mentally ill, disabled, a day labourer, a beggar, a robber, or an outlaw. And the stranger simply refused to play that game and went straight to those people who were outside and said, you're in. I love it. And Jesus, of course, also was this wonderful storyteller. I don't know what the sermon was like this morning. Were you preaching this morning, Bishop Michael? No. Okay. Anybody there? No, that's fine. Right. Um, I don't know if you used any, any stories, Michael, but you know, the, the tendency that we have is to use stories as kind of light relief or a bit of uh, just trying to make something relevant. So we'll just tell you a story. Um, but mainly we use stories for children's talks, etc. 
Well, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus was forever telling stories. A third of the words of the words of Jesus recorded in the New Testament are in story form. And he was using story all the time because he knew that that was real, it connected its, its first order language as opposed to our second order language, which we are always dealing with, you know, stuck in the head with concepts and ideas instead of giving story. Well, Jesus, with all his parables, there are about 40 parables that, uh, that are recorded and they can only be some of them. But, you know, they're about, well, I've got a list here. Let me just read this list because I won't remember it otherwise. He just used ordinary Galilean life. Very attractive. So in his teaching, he talked about wedding clothes and wedding traditions, wineskins, sawdust getting in the eyes, poorly producing trees, bad building foundations, soil, lamps, funerals, ploughing, scorpions, armed robbery, dirty dishes, garden herbs, unmarked graves, sparrows, large barns, ravens and lilies, family disputes, weather forecasting, a donkey falling into a well, mustard seed, dough, a hen and her chicks, a field and its cows, Military strategy, useless salt, etc., etc. Lost sheep, lost coins, lost sons, you know. The images are huge and various. Great storyteller. And these stories are not single point stories with a moral meaning, you know, they're not allegories trying to say this means that, etc. They're just little, you know, explosive devices, really. Hand grenades in the soul, they, they disturb you, they, they tantalise you, they. They, they get under your skin and you think, what's going on there? And Jesus didn't explain them, just told them. Wonderful. Jesus, a storyteller. But Jesus was also a teacher beyond the stories. He did tell us, tell all sorts of, um, give all to- sorts of teaching, which was, of course, dynamic, really scary stuff. Again, let me just quote a few because I won't remember them otherwise. Um, but we know them all. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus did that on the cross. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. That's caused mayhem in ethical debate ever since, isn't it? Be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, you could hardly say, be reasonably good, could he? But, you know, it's still pretty demanding. Be perfect. Everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Exeunt, all men, stage left. <laughs> These are, you know, stunning little nuggets. If anyone wants to take your coat, give your cloak as well. You cannot be serious. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. That's a phrase deep in our culture, isn't it? The second mile. Don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How hard we find that one. You cannot serve God and wealth. Game, set and match. Do not judge. First take the log out of your own eye. Almost universally ignored. Ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. That's a a promise claimed a million times a day, isn't it? And so on and so on, These one, this wonderful teaching. And what it is, of course, is something, again, that tantalises us. Do we take this seriously? Is it an exaggeration, you know, hyperbole, exaggeration for the sake of emphasis? Is it giving a, a new religious ethic, you know, what, a new system, moral system? What, is, what are these things? What, are, what is this teaching? Somebody said, we're so used to standing on our heads that when God shows up, we think he's the one who's upside down. Now that's, that's what's really going on, I think. That we've got things so screwed up that we don't recognise what a really godly culture, society, life would look like. And so what Jesus is saying here is not, um, here's a new ethic for you, try hard, if you get half marks, you're in. You're not, not going back to all of that. What he's saying is that this new world order is breaking in, even now. I'm bringing it in. Notice it, see it, contribute to it, live it. But it's, uh, it's all tantalising stuff. And uh, Jesus the healer, the miracle worker. I don't know what you make of the, of the miracles, but you cannot rule them out. They're all there. The, the New Testament is stuffed with them. I don't know what happened. I mean, some people say, um, well, 
with the great miracle of the incarnation, everything else then becomes possible. Other people say, well, hang on, you know, we can, there's no possibility of the regularities of nature being interrupted, but all sorts of strange things might have happened. <laughs> Others again say, well, let's make a distinction between the nature miracles and the healing miracles. Perhaps that's easier. You know, we try all sorts of things to try to understand what was going on. I don't know what's going on. Austin Farrow writes about it very interestingly, I think. But, but I think for me, the important thing is to see that, that the miracles are, what's more important is not their historicity, but their, their meaning. John called them signs. They're pointing towards a new creation, a new order of things. I think secondly I would say that we can't just refuse to accept miracle on the a priori grounds that they cannot happen. You know, that's bad logic and it's also increasingly bad science. You know, physicists in particular will tell us about the, um, the extraordinary uh, possibilities in a, a, a world that is not a, a mechanistic closed order but is extraordinary, supple uh, and open, open textured. Um, and I wonder whether, in fact, in the miracles, we're, they're not breaches of the natural law so much as examples of a, of a deeper law of nature, which we occasionally touch. I don't know. But we can't ignore them. And all in all, what we see is Jesus, the visionary, I think. You know, he's a storyteller, he's a teacher, he's... Um, he's a miracle worker, he's a subversive, you know, he's, he's this magnificent outsider, but he is a visionary about the kingdom of God. There are hardly any references outside the Gospels to the kingdom of God. It's Jesus' particular phrase. No one else seems to have really caught on to it, you know, what does he mean? So they ignored <coughs> it. But it's absolutely central to what Jesus was about. It wasn't a manifesto for political reform. It wasn't a blueprint for a church. It wasn't a new ethical system. It was a new way of ordering life, of seeing reality, and of putting God at the center of everything. The kingdom of God, intriguing again, tantalizing. But where was all this gonna lead? You know, you can't have someone who is living such a radically different kind of life, who's challenging, the religious aristocracy, uh, the imperial aristocracy, the economic aristocracy. You can't have someone challenging all that and getting away with it scot-free. And all these lines, as it were, converged in some kind of tragic experiment in perspective on the cross. And that's where uh, the logic of how Jesus lived um, went. And the fury of the cross, I won't go into it, but the fury of the cross is hard to contemplate, isn't it? And yet it's the place where we, we believe that you know, God himself was in there, in that desperate figure. And what, he was, what God was doing there was actually taking on himself the massive attack of evil and soaking up evil to take it away. Though the cost was appalling and so the victory there's a scene in uh, Mel Gibson's blood fest you know the uh, the passion of the Christ there's a scene there where Jesus is on the road uh, to Calvary and on the Via Dolorosa he falls and there's a flashback to um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, rushing to him as a, as a little lad uh, in Nazareth, rushing to him to pick up a little lad who's fallen over. And you have that flashback, and then you're back in the, the reality. There is Jesus on the floor, on the Via Dolorosa, with the blood and the sweat and the dirt around him, and Mary at his side. And Jesus just says from down there in the dirt, he just says, Mother, See how I make all things new. You think, what? But that's the reality. That's what's going on in this cross and resurrection. Jesus making all things new. So there we are, following, trying to follow this Jesus. <laughs> a 
I'll be very quick. Is that all right? Because um, we must just look at the wake, you know, that what actually has happened because of this figure and the way he lived. I've looked at my own autobiography. I've looked at a bit of these different dimensions of the life of Jesus. Because as was being pointed out beforehand in a conversation we had, that um, you leap in so often in the church's year, year you know, you've leapt from uh, the birth of Jesus to the death of Jesus and then the life of the Spirit in the early church. But the, the actual life of Jesus hardly gets a look in. You know, you've quickly gone through it till you're in Lent. Um, this life of Jesus had a, has had a huge impact. H.G. Wells, you know, said, um, I'm a historian, he said, I'm not a believer. But I have to say, as a historian, that this um, penniless preacher from Galilee is irrevocably the very centre of history. And so we know him uh, to be. And the effect he's had has been just profound at, at every point. I, I think of it in terms of uh, the outworking of the compassion of Jesus and the confrontation of Jesus and the contrast that Jesus um, makes in, should make in our lives. Um, I once received a, um, a card uh, with the caption, um, I tried to change the world, but I couldn't get a babysitter. It's a lovely idea. Um, you know, we want to make a difference, but how do we do it? And again and again, I think it's only the great religious traditions that are powerful enough levers to bring about real change. Otherwise, self-interest is forever stopping it. Um, and this life of Jesus has had such a huge impact and the lives of other great formative religious figures, but we're with Jesus. Um, to change the world, you need a Jesus. The compassion of Jesus has been extraordinary. Um, it's been worked out that each month, churchgoers in this country give 23 million hours of voluntary service outside their going to church on Sunday. There are half a million children under 16 involved in Church of England youth and children's activities every week. Uh, in, our, in our country. There's a huge impact that we are by far the largest voluntary organisation uh, in the country. Um, we've been the, at the roots of healthcare wherever we've gone, haven't we? If you look back to the, the Knights Hospitallers in, in Jerusalem or to the work of the monasteries before that or the work of Florence Nightingale in Crimea or the, um, or, uh, and, you know, the hospice movement with uh, Cicely Saunders or um, do you know, 40% of primary health care in sub-Saharan Africa is run by the churches? 40% of primary health care. So, you know, we've, we've always put health as a really crucial part of the, the healing, the salvation that Jesus brings. Education. Massive investment in education. By the late 6th century, you know, most of the schools were being run in this country, run by the, the monasteries and the, and the great cathedrals as they started to be built. Uh, and you get the universities, of course, and you get grammar schools, and you get some of our great independent schools started. But in, in 1811, as we uh, celebrated here last year, uh, no, we didn't. <coughs> so sorry. It's Westminster Abbey, wasn't it? Yeah. <coughs> um, and uh, we were, but we were remembering 200 years of the National Society, uh, which actually founded, at one time, 12,000 schools in the country. Um, the only schools were being run by the churches, by the parishes. Then, 60 years later, the state came in, you know, and said, you're doing a good thing, we'll try and help you in this. Um, but the churches were there first, we always have been. All the great charities, look at what they have done. You know, the Oxford Committee for Famine Relief, remember that, 1942, met in St Mary the Virgin Church in Oxford uh, because of the, uh, the dire straits uh, of, the, um, of the Greek people, the blockade there. And out of that came Oxfam, uh, run by, it was started by Anglicans and Quakers meeting uh, there in, in Oxford. Um, in 1961, Peter Benenson, Roman Catholic, uh, appalled at the way that these two Portuguese young men, just raising a toast to freedom, had been uh, imprisoned for seven years, wrote to the Observer to complain. 
uh, and people flooded in their, um, their support and uh, Amnesty International was started. Chad Farrah starting the Samaritans when a 13-year-old girl committed suicide because of not knowing what was happening to her body um, and so on and so on. You know, Christian Aid, CAFOD, Tier Fund, Tradecraft, founded in the college I taught at, St John's College in Durham uh, in 1979, founded from there at any rate. Um, the Children's Society, you know, wherever you look, Christians have been right at the heart of things. Um, Barak Brahma really became a Christian um, from agnosticism because he was told when he was doing community organization in Chicago, uh, he was told, look at what the churches are doing. That's where the action is. Uh, and he wanted to be part of that uh, and so on. So compassion has always been part of our, our gift. But confrontation has also been part of the gift. If, you, if you're fishing uh, down, uh, down river and you keep on, and all the fish coming past are dead, um, there comes a time when you say, well, let's go upstream and see what's poisoning them. And if you go upstream, you find that it's the social structures and the political action and so on that is causing so often the problems that we're encountering compassionately downstream. And therefore, you know, Elizabeth Fry uh, and prison reform, Shaftesbury and all the, the reforms uh, to the Factory Act and the Lunacy Act and all the rest of it, uh, housing and education, um, Wilberforce with slavery, uh, all of this coming out of Christian conviction, um, the Clapham sect and so on. Do you know, I think this is right, Michael, isn't it, that um, when Wilberforce signed the first anti-slavery bill, it was signed on the same table that they sometimes use in Holy Trinity Clapham for communion on a Sunday. I love that, you know, the communion table is where slavery is confronted. But the Jubilee 2000 and the Make Poverty History movements and so on, that's all been part of our, our current um, expression of this confrontation, as has, of course, all that's happened uh, to, dis to take apart apartheid. I was, the other year I was in um, South Africa, in Cape Town, and, and went to District 6. Has anybody been there? And it's, uh, you know what that's like. It's the area that they cleared uh, of, of the blacks um, because apartheid demanded it. It was far too close into the centre. They cleared it. But the one building you find they didn't destroy was a church. You couldn't destroy the church. And the church ultimately destroyed apartheid, <coughs> uh, if you like. Um, and Martin Luther King was the same, and communism actually was the same. That's another whole story. I would also want to say, though, that what really matters, what really matters is the way we live individually. Compassion, yes. Confrontation, yes. But the contrast in the way we live will be ultimately what will change people's lives. Do they see a difference in us? Or do they just see lives that are you know, pretty much like any other? Um, 21st century, consumer-led, um, you know, wishy-washy kind of life. Are we different enough is always my question. Um, we've always tried to be, you know, whether we've gone off to the deserts uh, of North Africa because we've now got too um, politicised, uh, with Constantine taking us into the mainstream, uh, whether it's been the, um, the religious community set up by Benedict. We were at Monte Cassino last Monday. Extraordinary experience. Um, whether it's been the Reformation, you know, protesting ag against um, the, the shoddiness of the church, whether it's been the evangelical revival um, in the 18th century or the Oxford movement in the 19th century or, you know, whatever, whatever. We've always tried this semper reformanda, like keep reforming the church, try to be different. And so often we fail. And young people are very fed up with the church very often today because we're just not different enough. There's a whole lot I could say there. Look, we must come to an end. Um, can I just read you a, a, just a final section of this book that I wrote? Um, because it kind of sums up where I'd like us to, uh, to end. Jesus is the plot, the subplot, the chapter headings and the footnotes of Christianity. Moreover, the story of Jesus uh, continues to haunt the world with its humility, majesty, and truth. People may dismiss the church, but they rarely dismiss Jesus. Jesus is the transforming presence at the heart of the church 
and of a vast number of lives. With the church globally increasing at the rate of over 70,000 a day, did you know that? That's net growth. With the church globally increasing at the rate of over 70,000 a day, it seems that nothing can stop Jesus attracting people to himself. He turns around lives that are lost and in pain. He inspires projects and programs of social reform worldwide. He causes people to live and die heroically. He is the best that humankind has ever been and the joy of man's desiring. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. And so he draws us from who we once were to who we are now and towards who we shall be one day. Spike Milligan lived and died as a great comedian, but shortly before his death, he wrote a foreword for a book called The Good God Guide. And in it, he said, as a lad, I was very religious, much moved by the life and death of Jesus. I prayed to him every night and went to mass every Sunday. Now I'm ancient and don't go to church anymore. The conscience still twitches a bit as a result, but I'm basically a Jesus man still. A Jesus man is about as good a goal as I can hope to achieve in this life. I shall count it a privilege to stay in Jesus' good company for all my time ahead until I too hear that final note. And I believe that note will be played and played perfectly by the master musician himself, Jesus, who came that I might have life and have it more abundantly than I ever dreamed possible. I rest my case. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for earthing it in your own life and experience, which is uh, not only helpful, but very moving at times. Does anybody have questions, please, Bishop John? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yes, love is, a, is, a, is one of those wonderful words that that we love to use but of course it's we've only got the one word in the English language you know if we had eros and agape and you know the, the broader words we would uh, perhaps use it more richly but yes that is what we're talking about and thank you for just reminding me compassion is about love in action um, and uh, I'm very happy to to be corrected on not using that word enough thank you Thank you. No, you're quite right. It's just me, my hyperbole again. It's, uh, uh, I mean, I imagine, I imagine um, that what you see of Jesus on what Jesus would have been like on the cross would have been a whole gamut of emotions. What we see in the in the Gospels and what we're used to seeing in religious art, of course, is either a very um, uh, sad figure, very con but a, a quite a controlled figure in a sense, maybe uh, looking anguished. But what does anguish mean if you take it apart? I think it means um, screaming agony. Uh, you know, when, you, when your body is, is just screaming for breath and, and, you, and you're sagging and you push yourself up and it hurts like hell and you go down again. You know, just awful. And I imagine that would have led to tears of pain. Um, I imagine, it, you know, a whole lot of emotions going through him. We have some nice seven words which we pluck out, but I, sometimes I try to get behind the um, uh, the kind of two-dimensional um, descriptions to a three-dimensional experience. Wonderful book by Sarah Maitland. Anyone know that? Uh, the Stations of the Cross. It's a brilliant book for doing just that. And do you agree? Oh, indeed. Yes. Well, another wonderful book. But she does write uh, very evocatively in, the, um, uh, in the, the, the Stations of the Cross. And I, I think the baptised imagination, as the Baptist preacher would probably call it, is sometimes uh, acceptable. So I use the word weeping in that, uh, in that hyperbolic sense. Thank you. There's a $65 million question, isn't it? Um, of course, he's been brought in on every side of, of that argument, hasn't he? I have personally a, a great deal of sympathy with the, the pacifist position. 
but then I just get to the human reality of, you know, my family, um, and I say, of course I would defend them. And I multiply that up and I get to this other position. The trouble is, someone said, you know, we start fighting wars in the spirit of the New Testament, but end up fighting them in the spirit of the Old. Um, and, you know, we, we just, just get it wrong every time. So um, I think probably, though I'm very deeply sympathetic, I mean, this is my response, um, deeply sympathetic to the pacifist position, I think at the end of the day, Jesus possibly would have said, this evil must stop. And the only way it can be stopped is by a minimal use, just war theory, um, of, uh, of, of violent means. But it's a very hard call, that one. What do you think? Is it fair for me to ask? I would absolutely agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We're on the same page, right? Now, I think we ought to stop so that uh, uh, we can go on to other things. Uh, I think there are copies of the bishop's book at the back. Oh, is it coming forward if anybody wants to buy? And the bishop just told me that uh, since writing this, he's, he's just published a new book, Jesus, no, God, no, God, lost, God and lost and found, looking at the reality of sometimes we all lo lose God and, you know, well, we think we've lost him, we haven't, of course, because he's there. But, uh, but, that, but today we have copies of this book if anybody wishes to buy them here at the front. So again, thank you so much, Bishop. Thanks. My pleasure.